his PhD work was focused on looking at what was the minimum density and the minimum size of a kelp forest to survive. And surprisingly, <coughs> Macrocystis giant kelp, which we have here, needs a minimum density and a minimum size in order to thrive, in order to do well. And it has something to do with the way the juveniles grow up and the amount of open space that's there and all the rest of it. But effectively, the big kelp trees grow up and they, they, they canopy and they cover and shade what's down below. And that shading gives enough space for juvenile macrocystis kelps to get a foothold and to start growing. If they didn't have the shade, other species would be in there and would cover them up. So it's like having between a forest, it's like having the difference between a forest and a jungle. The forest has space, and you can swim between the trees, you know, as you're scuba diving or snorkeling in a kelp forest. In, if you don't have the canopy, it turns into a jungle. And that jungle we might illustrate by uh, one of the pictures here, this one. This is kind of the jungle situation. And this is more of the, the canopy where there's space in between. This is still pretty dense, but there's space enough for the juveniles to take root and grow. And so I think that's a key distinction is being able to develop that. So they've taken uh, they've, they've taken some individuals and they're crossbreeding them in the laboratory from eastern Tasmania and then outplanting those individuals in the Storm Bay region. So we'll do one near the fish pens, one is a control, and one near Bruni Island, which is an indigenous island where they have made a strong commitment to restore sea country, which is the indigenous term for sea country for the ecosystem in the marine environment. And so we're developing a proposal in Australia, we're calling it Caring for Sea Country. And it's about regenerating that kelp forest and restoring it right on shore, like right where it used to be. So restoration is an active and real thing in Tasmania. In the future, restoring kelp forest can be a real thing in California. In the meantime, we'll have an artificial platform offshore doing it. Now, technology-wise, there are several ways of doing this. If you're in deep water, you just have a vertical pipe or hose that goes straight up and irrigates your system. It's very short, it's more affordable. But if restoration is the key, and here's an example with Hong Low Seawater Air Conditioning. They bring water up from 500 meters down, they run it through the heat exchanger, and they cool off half of downtown Honolulu. That's 100 megawatts of deep sea water cooling that can be 10 times more efficient than a regular uh, traditional air conditioning system. Wow. So we're saving the most of the electrical power. In fact, we've done similar studies in Oman that has shown air conditioning and cooling is 70% of the electrical uh, load of a, a Middle Eastern city. If we can cut that a factor of 10, we will have cut by a factor of 10 the largest single electrical load, which cuts the entire electricity use of a city it eliminates most of the electricity use of that city, that more than half of it goes away. And so this technology has a transformative effect on energy use. And the interesting part is that when that water comes back, in this case it's got 150 megawatt thermal left over, we can use it to seasonally cool these reefs that actually went underwent 50% coral bleaching in 2016, which I never thought I would see in my life. We lived in Hawaii for three years. Never thought it would be so hot that we'd have coral bleaching in Hawaii, and yet we have 50% bleaching there, and uh, even higher levels in the Great Barrier Reef. And once that uh, cooling of a few tenths of a degree has been done, then we could actually run the water further out to a marine permaculture, which still would have to be permitted by the EPA because it's in a fixed location, and uh, and then grow a, a fish habitat and a seaweed farm further out. But that would take a lot of doing because there are many uh, marine ecologists in Hawaii that are very afraid of any kind of seaweed growing because of the, some of the bad experiences that occurred in the 1990s with alien seaweeds. So that's going to require a fair amount of permitting to do. But we can use local seaweeds from Hawaii, and over the you know again it's a multi-year process that eventually that could be done. In the meantime, uh, ocean-going uh, marine permaculture vessels should be able to grow local and regional seaweeds offshore with far less of an issue. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of the step-by-step -step process, yes? I was wondering about the question of invasives. I yes. haven't heard you say anything about that. 
Well, I think the key is to focus on region and, and have a permaculture in a region where we're using local kelps, local sardines, and local um, vertebrates and invertebrates. That's really the key. But generally, we think about uh, these mesoscale eddies, and I do want to show you a background movie of our, our mesoscale eddies. NASA's Perpetual Ocean, this is a really beautiful version of it, and there's um, short and long versions of it, but I'll, um, I'll show you one of the shorter ones right now. Uh, let's see, this is probably this one. Um, picture and this is a picture of the Gulf Stream that we're going by and I'll show the California current here probably in a bit as well. But these mesoscale eddies are pinned in places like the Santa Barbara Channel. Mm -hmm. So you have an eddy with a fairly predictable circulation pattern and you can use that to effectively go around the circle once and come back to the same place every three months or so. Mm -hmm. And so I think that has a big effect on our ability to um, effectively guide these systems eventually using the cloud and the communications network and effectively provide um, guidance that to enable these to be harvested every three months or so. Does that answer your question or do you yes, have a different question? So these question? ocean going right. uh, vessels are local. They're local. They're local. Places. They're regional. The eddies. They're pinned right. to a particular island. Okay. For example, if you go off Hawaii or even if these parts of the Middle East, in the lee of an island you'll have a pinned eddy. And so that pinned eddy stays in one place. This, I mean, this is just so beautiful. It's like a Van Gogh rendition yeah. of the Earth. Yeah. And who, who would have known that this was actually the way the energy works? And there's more energy in these eddies than there is in the steady state ocean currents. Um, the Couple five questions. gyres, is that, is that contributing to the five gyres? And is there a way to maybe stop the ocean plastics from getting the gyres to begin with while they're still potential? That's a good question. Gyres. I've yet to see the, the pile of plastic. Um, I'm sure that, I know there's a lot of plastic in the ocean, and there are a few local regions where there are. The gyres are very large compared to these mesoscale eddies. These right. eddies are maybe 50 or 100 kilometers in diameter, and the gyres are 5,000 kilometers in diameter. Um, so the energy of these dynamics do contribute to the uh, gyres in the ocean. Uh, but I think on a local scale, uh, it's these eddies that actually have most of the power in the ocean. and so. We have a lot of people working on uh, less plastic and we're working on the more fish side of the equation. And I have one other question. And yes. Hit me for Go ahead. Question. Have there been any studies on either um, uh, processing of seaweed of microplastics that are already in the ocean there uh, and God forbid bioaccumulation in seaweed? Well, that's a good question. There's very little bioaccumulation in seaweed because the seaweed is not ingesting plastics. The seaweed is what you call autotrophic, and what autotrophic means is that it's absorbing inorganic nitrate, inorganic phosphate, and inorganic micronutrients from the seawater itself in dissolved form. Unlike a fish who's eating a solid plankton or a zooplankton or a copepod, or a piece of microplastic. The fish is ingesting. I was thinking more maybe the toxins are the microplastic, but maybe the toxins are just so adsorbed to the plastic that's not an issue. Uh, yeah, the, the, there's minimal ingestion of plastic in the case of these seaweeds, and um, that also means that there's minimal effect of the plastic on the seaweed. This is a slower version of the same. Um, the same system, and so it's a fun backdrop <laughs> to be thinking about planet ocean <laughs> while we're while we're talking about this. More questions. Does a marine permaculture vessel port not need to reach the surface to form a canopy? And that's what's the very good question. The there are bubbles on macrocystis. Uh, they call them pneumatocysts, and they're at the base of each kelp leaf, and so those will tend to make the kelp grow vertically, or in some cases, uh, if there's a current <clears throat> or a shear current, they'll start growing laterally as well. But, um, so normally it will grow to the surface, and several things happen. If we know that a hurricane's coming, we can actually harvest the kelp down, like get rid of two-thirds of the length of the kelp, and cut the drag by a factor of three. 
So you can harvest it down to one and a half meters depth. There's still 20 meters below it. So it still has the environment of the forest. It's just that the canopy is reduced. And so that effectively reduces the drag. So you have a better chance of your system lasting. Now, if you have a ship go over it, over your, your marine permaculture, you may mow down some kelp but it won't harm the ship and it won't harm the marine permaculture. So the, that's the idea behind it, is you want it deep enough. And there's some scenarios where you'd actually consider in a big typhoon of taking a red seaweed platform that might be only five meters depth and lowering it to 30 or 40 meters depth to ride out the typhoon and then bring it back up again. So those are some of the alternatives we've got to try to figure out how to make the system typhoon resilient. So that's part of the engineering projects that we'll be doing uh, in the years ahead to ensure shipping resilience and typhoon resilience. But does it need sunlight to? Yes, we need enough sunlight. And here's the beauty of, um, I've, got, I've got some slides that show this. The beauty of seaweed is that it's figured out how to go from 0.8% efficiency, 0.8% uh, efficiency that we have from land plants. And the seaweeds have figured out how to go up to 8% efficiency. And that relates to what we were showing last night, and that is this double cropping and quadruple cropping in greenhouses. It turns out the seaweeds have figured out one of the biggest proteins known to man called the phycobilla protein. And these proteins act like an optical antenna collecting light and converting it from green and blue light into red light that is needed for the chlorophyll. There's no red light when you're down 25 meters. So you ask the question, how does the juvenile seaweed grow at 25 meters depth. And the way it does it is these phycobilla proteins absorb the green lights that's down there. And with 95% efficiency, they convert the green light to yellow light, and then phycocyanin uh, converts the yellow light to red light, and then they focus that light straight onto the chloroplast. So it's really an amazing picture. I have a couple of slides that I might be able to share with you on this. But it's, a, it's an amazing story, and um, that phycobilla protein we can actually harness in greenhouses to collect energy and sunlight and actually help plants on land grow better. But it's the same reason that you get the higher efficiency in the seawater. And so that's really a key part. Yes? So going off that question a little bit, sure. we're talking about um, um, rebuilding kelp forests near coastlines. Correct. Last night you spoke a little bit about how initially siltation and turbidity affected Yes. There are several key questions there. One is you can go further offshore. And if we go further offshore in the Santa Barbara Channel, visibility is oftentimes great enough to do better. One of the um, mussel farmers was actually in the um, session last night, and he commented that under worst spring conditions, the visibility is about four feet, but oftentimes he gets 40 foot visibility. Mm -hmm. And so if you go further, he's only in 70 feet of water. So if we actually go to the deeper portions of the Santa Barbara Channel, we can expect higher visibility, which actually enables the kelp to grow at depths of up to 25 meters. And if we go a little further let, offshore, let's say near San Miguel Island or further west, then we'd expect uh, enough visibility to be able to grow uh, kelp year-round from the full depth. So that's a really key part. And one benefit of starting offshore further is that until such time as we've really decimated our runoff and, and improved the soil management practices on the farms, um, and, and really cut that runoff, we can be starting to grow offshore and eventually bring that closer onshore as we clear up our waters. So that's a really good question. Yeah, other questions, yes? How are you planting the kelp initially? That's a good question. Um, so we have hatcheries, and it turns out there's uh, asexual and sexual reproduction of kelps, just like flowering plants that we have on land. It's a little bit different, but um, in a hatchery, they actually are able to harvest spores that turn into gametophytes, and those gametophytes turn into sporophytes. And what they do is they take an aquarium where they've got all these gametophytes, and they put uh, spools of twine in the aquarium, and the gametophytes land on the spools and attach themselves. And so you end up getting 80 meter long uh, spools of twine that are loaded with gametophytes. And once they grow to about two millimeters long or three millimeters long, they, you can actually wind those onto long lines in the, in the sea. And, that, and then they will attach to the long lines and grow a hold fast. And so you can do it to long lines, but you can also do it 
into polyethylene tubes and pipes. And uh, one of us mentioned that they're into um, aquaponics. So we kind of view this as marine hydroponics, if you will, in that we're um, adding the limiting nutrients effectively by bringing it out from the deep. So it's not really adding so much as upwelling those nutrients and effectively doing hydroponics in the sea. And there are questions about buoyancy and other details and how we'll have to work out some of the details. But effectively, if we can supply the plants with enough light and enough uh, nutrients year round, we might be able to get twice as much production as you have traditionally on a kelp forest. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the kelps off here, we have two kinds of limitations. In the winter time, they could be light limited if it's cloudy all the time or limited sunlight. And if you go further north, they are light limited. In the summer, you get warm water near the surface and they become nutrient limited. So we're getting maybe one season in the spring and one season in the fall. Now imagine that we go a little further offshore where there's less turbidity and you've got enough light year round because now the water's clearer. And in the summertime, you've got enough nutrients because that's just a couple hundred meters down and you provided this irrigation system. We could go from two crops per year to four crops per year. And that would be incredible in terms of productivity if we can increase the capacity factor. So this notion of marine hydroponics, if you will, um, is one that we would love to refine and embrace the best practices we have on land and ask, how do we generalize this to the sea? How do we adapt it to the sea and enable that to work? And we've got early ideas of how we're gonna distribute the water, how we're gonna irrigate the seaweeds, et cetera. But we have to address you know, where the seaweed needs the nutrients and what times and all the rest. Is it just daytime? Does it need to be 24 hours a day? All these questions need to be worked out. At the local scale, that's why we're gonna do hectare scale seaweed forests to begin with. But this is gonna be one of the key development questions and also materials. You know, Polyethylene for now is the standard material of choice because the Natural Energy Lab has a 50 year track record of, um, of durable. doing that. It's incredibly durable. If you go to NELHA, this is the Natural Energy Lab Hawaii Authority, it's this amazing thing where <clears throat> they've got these deep water pipes that are coming up from 2,000 uh, feet below the surface. And I wonder if they show a picture of the pipeline here. But effectively, there's a, probably a half a dozen uh, pipes, uh, and I'm wondering there's some pictures. They were growing kelp there uh, a while ago, ago. And for abalone culture. Wonderful. But that, not yeah, no, I think it's uh, a big deal, and uh, I've, I've gone diving on these pipes, and uh, they look at uh, ocean energy conversion, um, ocean thermal energy is one of the applications here, this OTEC one. We think this may be a leading way of doing the, the piping over time. They're not emphasizing the deep water pipes as much right now, which is ironic. But it's a little bit like the Honolulu Seawater Air Conditioning Company, this one, where they have the deep water pipes that come up to, towards the surface. And that's the model that we've been using. Now, we've got a huge amount of bamboo in the Philippines, across Asia, and even potentially in California. And the bamboo, I think, can be a structural material we have to explore further. It has to be uh, marine treated so it doesn't rot pretty quickly. But uh, we think starting with polyethylene, emphasizing 100% reuse and use of recycled polyethylene and an opportunity to increase the use of bamboo over time is gonna enable us to use uh, best practices and materials today and move towards more and more natural building materials in the future. Brett? Which is kind of, now this is getting kind of where my question is. So sure. you're, you're looking at kind of the life cycle, energy in, energy out, you know, impacts the environment and all that kind of stuff. And because that seems, I'm influenced by uh, Richard Heinberg and the guy from Livermore, Lawrence Livermore, that kind of did the study and concluded that, you know, renewables aren't going to save us because just the cost uh, and the amount of fossil fuels we have to burn to build up a renewable infrastructure is so massive. And so I always wonder about, well, when I see things like that, you know, sure. all the infrastructure, how much energy and fossil fuels are going into building the is infrastructure, and uh, is there a simpler way, right. <laughs> you know, right. et cetera. That's a good question. My impression is it takes about one year of energy from a um, solar module, if you will, to 
uh, to produce the energy needed for the solar module, but it has a life of 20 to 30 years. And so there is a, a definite positive return that occurs, an interest, if you will. And you, we almost think of a solar module as a bank account where you have to put in a time deposit and you get a dividend out each year. And so there's an interesting aspect to that. Similarly, when we have 3,000 tons of uh, seaweed coming off uh, each square kilometer of marine permaculture, there are some people that are working on bioplastics from seaweeds, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. presents an interesting <laughs> alternative, you know, that would be Circular ultimately biodegradable. <laughs> so that would be a nice alternative to using fossil-based systems, but effectively, if we're using recycled polyethylene, then we can keep reusing it. We see that as a near-term approach, and eventually moving towards more natural materials. Yes, Catherine. Um, so what I understood is there are quite a lot of moving parts in that system. Moving parts? <laughs> yeah. We have pumps and things, yes. In the water. Yes. And we would like them to keep moving. So is there an issue with the anti-fouling work? Anti-fouling. Yeah. Yes, so. good question. So we try to minimize the number of moving parts. When it comes to the guidance uh, system, we're thinking about um, literally a runner sled works by bending its members to the right or to the left. And um, so in that sense, you don't require rotating parts or other things like this. So if we're steering like a runner sled, then literally we can bend the polyethylene to the left or bend it to the right and effectively get locomotion. Yeah. So that's one example of a biofouling resistant or resilient system. Uh, and other exa examples include the kind of electric pumps that we're using. Today, it's uh, submersible pumps that are used to very corrosive environments. So these will probably need service, and what we're expecting in the medium term is to develop marine permaculture to the point where a service interval of every three months enables a three-month harvest and a three-month fishery catching the fish around the permaculture. Mm -hmm. Then, at the same time, there's a certain amount of preventative maintenance that's done every three months, and so it becomes a service interval. And then every three years, we'd have a major overhaul. So the estimated life of kelps under best conditions is six to seven years. And so we're thinking every three years or every six years, you need to probably do some reseeding of the kelp. So this would be a larger overhaul. And you'd also probably have to do this biofouling reduction if there are any heat exchangers or other things that we'd have to do that this. So this kind of three month to three year uh, minor and major maintenance interval is what we're anticipating for the system. And for this becomes an industry in itself. I mean, if uh, the Santa Barbara Channel, I like to think of it as ocean light, so in some ways it's easier to work in the channel than you go around, you get, poke your nose around the corner in Concepcion and you get some really big waves. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's the kind of thing where you could start in the channel and build some hectare scale permacultures, and then as the systems become more resilient, start testing them out past San Miguel Island. And that's the kind of opportunity that would enable us to incrementally learn before we go to one, another check, um, yes. time check for everyone. It's 11.15. Right. Oh How's everyone doing? Um, should we do, take a quick 10-minute bathroom uh, stretch break and not be gone very long? But we will also be one available break. over lunch. We can have you know, yeah. some conversations after noon. We we'll um, go until 12.30, so this great. would be a good in-between if everybody wants to stretch a little bit. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the restrooms are down that way, or you can go down into the lobby. There's another restroom. Shall we reconvene at 1130 in 10 minutes? Perfect. Yeah. Sure. We'll do that. Thank you. What I'd like to do is make sure we can address some key applications for seaweed and also address remaining questions that may be here. And I'm happy to stay on afterwards and get some lunch and talk with people further. <coughs> so I might have mentioned last night what we're calling, there's a dozen value chains for seaweed products and uh, products of marine permaculture. We're starting with what I'm calling the seven Fs. And the seven Fs are food, feed, and fertilizer, fish, fuel, fiber, and pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals <laughs> is a little short for pharmaceuticals. <laughs> pharmaceuticals. There we go, there we go. Um, we're calling them nutraceuticals to some extent because it's kind of a whole food uh, aspect, but I'm amazed at the antioxidants, phytonutrients, and omega-3 fatty acids that we know about in the seaweed. And I'll mention there are things that are in the seaweed that we don't know about that I think would be really profound. For example, the hydrocolloids that we know are in most seaweeds 
are prebiotics in the sense that they are this great substrate for your gut microbiome. And we know that the gut microbiomes of Asian <coughs> seaweed eaters, including Japanese and Thai uh, people, um, is much more diverse than the United States. And so the conjecture is that the prebiotics contribute towards a healthy and robust gut microbiome. So this is a really interesting unfolding story, and I think uh, we'll learn a lot more about it. Uh, so that's one of the many benefits. Uh, I also want to touch on a particular area. We talked about uh, some of the pigments and proteins in seaweeds, uh, and there are proteins. And I'd like to go through that story a little bit, because we didn't get a chance to cover it quite so much last night. Um, we talked about the application of pigments to make things like double cropping, quadruple cropping greenhouses. And by the way, they built one of these wonderful magenta greenhouses in UC Santa Cruz. And what's great is that this uh, phycobilla protein is the active ingredient, phycoerythrin in particular, in these uh, greenhouses. And we're developing now the ability to thermally stabilize and UV stabilize these proteins so that they can be resilient on the top of the greenhouse in full summer, which would be the key to making them work uh, better and better in, in these uh, greenhouse applications. But it all starts with seaweed pigments. And so here I have got a, a regular leaf and a kelp leaf. And the question is, which do you think is more efficient and why? I may have spoiled it a little bit. But uh, you know, the amazing thing is that that land leaf is 0.2% to 2% efficient using regular chlorophyll A um, photosynthesis. And for, and the mystery and amazement is that <clears throat> the kelp leaf can be up to 8% efficient. And that efficiency comes from key molecules like phycobilla proteins, which are very big proteins that act like a light antenna and collect sunlight. And here in these red seaweeds, it tends to be phycoerythrin and phycocyanin. In brown seaweeds, there are similar ones that I think are related to fucoidins and there may be a couple of other proteins that are slipping my mind at the moment. But let's dive into some of the science behind these pigments to uh, understand how they work. So if you look at regular land photosynthesis, there's this huge gap in the spectrum. And it, people wonder, how, how did evolution ever create this, this gap where the blue light is used to guide the growth of the land plants and the red light is used to uh, actually grow the plants. Well, if you look at the solar spectrum, the peak in the solar spectrum is right around green, and then it drops down again. So we're just looking at the little shoulders. You know, it's like most of the light is wasted. And it's a very interesting story, because we think that actually the ancient seaweeds were like these red seaweeds with phycoerythrin and phycocyanin and everything else. This is the ancient algae that existed billions of years ago. And the green algae grew up and evolved underneath the red algae in the sea. And so they only got the dregs, the leftover we light. Work harder. <laughs> we so work harder. it could be that this was the ancient, the ancient light collecting was the main <coughs> sunlight. And the green algae used the leftovers in the corners to survive. And yet those green algae ended up being the ones that crawled on the land or became the land plants somehow. And uh, so it's really interesting to see, consider the evolutionary history that leads to this. But if we go back to the red algae, you can see how the entire visible light spectrum is used. And that gives a hint as to why it works. Because if you're down 30 meters under the sea, you're going to get a little bit of green and blue light, and that's it. So how on earth would a photosystem 2 even operate if there's no red light? And the way this works is, this antenna here is composed of phycoerythrin out here that converts green light to yellow light. Phycocyanin, actually it's a combination of the two, uh, in the middle in here that converts the yellow light to red light. And then allophycocyanin pumps that light right into this chlorophyll A center, which is the traditional red light absorber that actually is the ones that we're used to in plants. <clears throat> so imagine decorating with this big molecule, decorating your greenhouse so you can take all the green light and all of the yellow light and 
get it to fluoresce so you can have 500 watts a square meter of, of concentrating luminescent solar concentrators, like we talked about last night. And at the same time, increase the red light flux to the plants so your plants in your greenhouse grow faster because they've got more red light than they would if they were out in the open. And that's the two for one benefit that we're talking about here. And there's some wonderful benefits to these uh, phycobilla proteins where they actually use them for um, fluorescent markers. So there's a $4 billion fluorescent marker industry. And in high purity, these are worth more than their weight in gold. It's amazing. So that's one crop. I mean, and some seaweeds have like 1% phycobilla proteins. So it literally, you know, if you can find out affordable ways of purifying it, it becomes extremely valuable. Even in lower concentrations, this ends up making an incredible bright pink lipstick for cosmetics. <laughs> <laughs> and what's amazing is if you actually, um, if you've been, ever been to a uh, techno contra or a rave concert, they have black lights, right? So if you put this on a black light, it turns brilliant orange. Yeah. I mean, it's like the most fluorescent molecule known to man. Right. So now suddenly the idea of lipstick, uh, body paint, face paint, all these things come up. So the idea of uh, having a playful cosmetic product is really interesting. Um, probably the bigger cosmetic market is actually in hydrocolloids, and that is a moisturizer that's coming straight from the seaweed. These hydrocolloids attract the moisture and hold it. And so um, that ends up being a direct extract of the seaweeds. And these hydrocolloids have been used for decades as a moisturizer for, uh, for cosmetics. And so that's another major product that um, needs to be explored further and is already being used in many portions of, the, um, of Asia, certainly. So that's kind of touching on a few of these areas. Are there particular products that people, well, we could talk about health benefits if you'd like yeah. so you can dive deeper in that. Uh, would people like to hear more? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Particularly, you know, just eating it directly because yeah. the right. processing to me. The whole foods. Yeah, the whole food aspect. Definitely. I'm just throwing that out. My interest. That would be cool. Right. Okay, that's good. So, um, several things in that regard. Um, I'm going to dive into the health benefits a little bit and I'll see if I can find my sample. Yay! Whole seaweed. <laughs> so, I got this from Australia. My friend Joe Lane makes this golden kelp granules, which has been, uh, it's 100% it's Australian sea kelp, the colonial, that they harvest from the rocks in New South Wales in this beautiful rustic area. And they dry it by hand, it's a family business. And they also, they rinse this one so it's not very salty. You can find other ones that are much saltier. But this I actually use as a salt or pepper substitute that looks a lot more like pepper. And it's very savory. And it's 100% kelp. And so I'm going to pass this around the room, and I encourage people to just shake around a little bit like this and taste it. And it's something that I put on eggs and tomatoes. It's a very mild, savory taste. And I encourage you to give it a try and, uh, and check it out. <laughs> so that's a little bit of the whole food business. Um, and, and we've talked a little bit more. Remind me about um, seaweed sauerkraut, which is something that we're working on now. We have an active research group in that area. It has even more benefits. Uh, let's dive into some of the health, uh, health health aspects of this. Here's a, a graphic that shows the diversity of gut microbiome that exists in the rural area, in, correction, in Asia, in Eastern Asia. And in contrast, there are few, the idea is that we have fewer pre prebiotics in the States, and there's less um, gut biodiversity that's been observed in recent years. So that's one indicator and a contrast between, let's say, a traditional Japanese cuisine that has a lot of prebiotics involving seaweed. And, uh, well, those are some of the seaweed products, including some of the uh, seaweed granules that we were talking about. Um, the, we, we talked about some of the benefits here uh, from a nutritional standpoint. I think there are also some really compelling opportunities to talk about in terms of health. One of the most, there are a couple of cases that I think are really important to consider. We talked a little bit last night about cognitive health span of individuals, and I think that's gonna be a key one to touch on. Another is, for me, what's striking about breast cancer incidence in the studies that have been done there. And the third is gonna be uh, more from a nutritional standpoint, 
the, uh, the whole food dimension of it. So I'll try to touch on each of those. I'm going to refer to some slides from Jane Tees, who's a PhD, who's taught at Harvard University, University of Massachusetts, and now in uh, University of South Carolina. Um, she talks about traditional medicine and seaweed. In the traditional Chinese medicines, you use seaweed often to treat uh, illnesses, and along with Japanese folk medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. Hey, Brian? Go ahead. Uh, cutoff point for Brian is 1 o'clock, okay? So we stretch a half hour. That's fine. Yeah. No problem. Because he will give you it all. We, got, <laughs> we, got, we can't exhaust him, okay? That, that's great. No yeah, worries. I think it's really important. No worries. Yeah. Um, so this starts back in the early 1800s, and Jane found in Harvard uh, Medical Library uh, the Lancet from the early 1800s talking about seaweeds and, um, and production and food um, and, and health. Um, even going back to Egyptian texts, a salty vegetable was used in the treatment of breast tumors uh, based on texts from 2600 BC. And Egyptian texts also discuss um, the hair of the apt plant used to treat breast cancer. And Jane investigated if it was the seaweed itself that was conferring this benefit. So this was the chart I wanted to show you last night, and that is Australians and Americans, or probably somewhere between Australia and Philippines, have this high incidence of breast cancer, particularly above age 50, and it's a severe problem. And what's amazing is that if you look at Japan, an industrialized nation, and Thailand, it's almost an order of magnitude lower, right? And so Jane investigated, could this be associated with the seaweed itself? In the US versus Japan, you can see a factor of five difference in the incidence of breast cancer mortality. And here's some interesting numbers on breast cancer incidence based on place of birth and migration to the US. And here's Japanese living in Japan. And here they've been in the US for 10 years or less. Here they've been in the US for more than 10 years. And here are US born Japanese and US born non-Japanese. And yeah. so it's pretty clear that the environment is having an effect. And the question is what aspect of the environment? So along those lines, well, we look at the Western diet, which is loaded with omega-6, not so much omega-3. And you contrast that to the Asian diet, which has seaweed about three times a day. And I'd encourage you to get some of these seaweed granules from uh, New South Wales, from Joe jo Lane, and have them on your eggs or, or your tomatoes or your breakfast. I, I put them on lunch and dinner items as well and really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a key part. It certainly helps fiber, but for me, this is the compelling results is that with the right kind of seaweed um, used in drinking water in a mouse model, the mammary tumor incidence drops by more than an order of magnitude or two and confers a benefit that lasts for much, much longer. And to me, these results are compelling. That's why I had so much trouble with the chart last night. Go ahead. I didn't understand. I, I mean, you've got zero, all, right. this, all these incidents of zero, and right. I didn't really see that on the line. It was so much, I thought that was just the line. Was no. Like, this what is, is this chart showing? This is, this is the, you know, with the seaweed treatment oh, in the drinking water, so you have zero to minor amounts of tumors. Oh, yeah. and, I missed that last one. And I'm sorry I didn't explain it more clearly. And without the seaweed, 100% 100, 100 incidence of tumors oh, okay. in this mouse model. And so... What kind of seaweed is that? Okay. Uh, let me see. Andaria... That's an elusive here. It's called wakame in Japan. Right. So, you know, there's, there's thousands, hundreds of kinds of seaweed offshore here. I don't think it's going to be specific to one kind of seaweed. Um, and what we need to do is understand what are the key active components. I still recommend eating the whole seaweed as opposed to eating the, the purification, but because there are probably things in the seaweed that aren't in the purification. We can harvest them right in our harbor. That's great. Oh, so you're saying it's an invasive we can harvest. <laughs> no, that's great. And I think as long as you don't have a source of heavy metal pollution in the harbor, and optionally you can blanch the seaweeds. So what they do in the Philippines 
is they take the seaweed and they'll dip it in hot water, like at 80 degrees Celsius in two seconds, it's gonna be pasteurized. And then you can use it on a seaweed salad or something else. And so that's a great way. But you know, when I'm out surfing, I eat raw seaweed. <laughs> it tends to be uh, rooted on the rocks down below. So that way you know it's alive and healthy. And uh, you know, and I, I think it's worth trying. If you got clean water, uh, it's worth trying all sorts of kinds of seaweed. How much seaweed? I had an ounce or two when I was out surfing. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't take much. In fact, most of these supplemental studies are the equivalent of about an ounce or two per day. So it's not a lot. It's really kind of a condiment. What about the concern about heavy metal pollution? And also, where my family is, there's a nuclear power plant that's right. decommissioned about four miles away. Yes. So they've measured that there are you know, isotopes in the right. mud blocks. Well, first of all, heavy metals is important to understand. And radiation is important to understand more deeply. One of my colleagues in Woods Hole has been measuring the levels of Fukushima radiation across the Pacific Ocean. What's important to understand is the difference between detectability of radiation and its uh, therapeutic harmful effects that, and the different levels that are there. So because we have such sensitive ability to detect tiny amounts of radiation, the detection limit is very, very low. But there have been studies of submarine workers working in Connecticut by the thousands on, and they were getting minor radiation doses while they were working on the nuclear submarines. They, there was a hormeotic effect where for gamma-induced radiation, uh, less than twice the background level actually resulted in a longevity increase of zero to three years. This is called a, called a hormeotic effect. Now above 200%, of the background dose, the, pop, the, the lifespan decreased and dropped. Okay. But between 100 and 200 percent, there was actually a homeotic benefit to these workers, as determined by insurance actuaries. I say that because a little bit of radiation may not be that bad for you. If, if it's, if it's in, you know, gamma rays and, and, or, and, and, uh, and, and low dose and distributed over time, all of those caveats. But that's the kind of situation, and that's why, um, yes, Fukushima radiation is detectable in California, but no, it's not therapeutically damaging, and that's a really important distinction. Let's contrast that to methylmercury, where Harvard Medical has done a study that has traced concentrations of methylmercury down to the parts per trillion level, which is a neurodetection limit, and still find a cognitive deficit in children exposed to parts per trillion levels of methylmercury. So there is no minimum dose for methylmercury that we found that does not have developmental effects on children. And if you go to China, where there's a lot of coal power plants today, the methylmercury comes out of the smokestack, it rains down into the soil, it gets leached into the streams, leached into the rivers, and ends up in the sea. So a tuna fish, well, the amount of methylmercury, uh, I'll, I'll say it this way, a tuna fish caught in the South China Sea could have a thousand times the level of methylmercury of a sardine caught in the Pacific Ocean. And the reason is, the tuna is concentrating it by a factor of 50 over the sardine. And there's 20 times as much methylmercury in the South China Sea as there is in the Pacific Ocean because of all the coal power plants, which is another reason we should be getting rid of coal in the U.S. And, out, and elsewhere. So that contrast is, in radiation, <clears throat> there is a minimum therapeutic dose above which harm is, is found. For methylmercury, no minimum dose has been found. And so we should be worrying about methylmercury a lot more than we are about tiny bits of radiation. And so that kind of um, understanding of how critical methylmercury is and how we've covered the ocean with our coal power plants with methylmercury, that's a big deal. Uh, and Fortunately, if you've got clean water sources like we have around Santa Barbara and in the Pacific Ocean, we can raise a lot of very clean seaweed and very clean fish. And I will say that Harvard Medical has said, eat small fish, and I'll say and seaweed, because they found that the neuroprotective benefits of the EPA and DHA, long chain omega-3 fatty acids, exceeds the risk of the methylmercury and other heavy metals that the benefits 
of EPA and DHA cannot be overemphasized because if you analyze your brain and you look at all the EPA fatty acids, uh, the most the common and the greatest percentage of omega-3 fatty acids in your brain is DHA because it actually is what makes the membranes of the neurons. And as we know, as you get older, the brain tends to shrink. And one hypothesis for why the brain is shrinking is oxidation of DHA and lower supply of DHA, especially on a Western diet, because uh, the omega-6s and the omega-3s are competing for the same blood-brain channel to get into the brain. And so if you're loaded on a Western diet, you're 20 to 1, omega-6, omega-3. So 19 times out of 20, an omega-6 is getting in your brain, which is inflammatory, instead of an omega-3 that actually can be neuroprotective. So that's where we start getting into some of these Alzheimer's benefits. And this DHA is coming from the small fish, even though they bioaccumulate it. It's coming from the seaweed, and it's coming from the microbes. So let's so, get it from the seaweed, because we can't harvest enough fish at this stage to protect everybody in the world, but maybe we can do it more directly. The seaweeds can be up to 1% EPA and DHA, and ultimately, if, we, if and when we grow billions of sardines, uh, we'll be able to even more easily access it for sardines. But for vegetarians, and there's half a billion vegetarians in India, we've got to actually get the vegetarian source to them. And there's a lot of vegetarians here. Yes? Uh, Bert, do you have any information on the relative um, health of seaweeds from different areas? Get another. Well, we're aiming for radical transparency of seaweed products and other products and fish products. Ultimately, I hope it's going to be a QR code that you scan with your smartphone. It'll tell you all the micronutrients, the analysis, the ultimate analysis, all the heavy metals, you know, the whole thing. Give you a complete picture. But in the meantime, do we have? In the meantime, clean water is where it's at. So you want to be away from industrial sources of pollution. Um, I was in the South China Sea. I ate a little bit of seafood, but I wouldn't make it a regular habit. And uh, I think knowing where your fish comes from, knowing where your seaweed comes from is important. And from Alaska to, I wouldn't hesitate to eat seaweed that's in the Santa Barbara Channel if you're far enough away from an outfall, um, if you're far enough away from pollution sources. So do we have a source here that's harvesting it? <coughs> harvesting seaweed? Yeah, it's harvesting far enough out clean seaweed that we can buy. Can we get it at the farmer's market over here? That's a good question. Does anybody know? No, I don't think here. I know Mendocino, there's two great women, female owned companies, uh -huh. and they test for um, toxins. Yes, definitely. And I, Strong Arm Farms, I think, is one, and I forget okay. the name of the other one, but right. they're really good. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I have to say again, Harvard Medical has done the analysis, and when it comes to seaweed and forage fish, the neuroprotective benefits of the EPA and DHA that you get far outweigh the risks of the methylmercury or lead or other heavy metals. And so that's really key because the only protein, <coughs> animal protein that is associated with longevity is in fact forage fish. Sardines, anchovies, and s salmon that have been grown sustainably. So these kind of small forage fish definitely have a neuroprotective benefit definitely are good to be included as part of a pescatarian diet. And on the vegetarian side, sea vegetables is where it's at, uh, maybe including a zoan. Yes? Uh, answering Brad's question, do you have uh, a uh, health harvester? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but this sells primarily to the animal growers. Oh. <laughs> and I think that depending on how much you want to buy, you would probably sell you some. <laughs> we could turn, make a little business out of that, you know, buy enough to yeah. sell it at the farmer's market. Right. So um, there are prebiotic benefits to seaweed. This is a, a graphic of some of the um, prebiotic fiber components. Uh, it turns out when you eat sea seaweed, you get all, and they analyze microbiomes, they get all this bifidobacteria. And in Japan, that's a huge thing. I think the U.S. is in here somewhere and is right in the middle and much like order of magnitude lower levels of bifidobacteria, which are considered to be highly beneficial. And so this is an analysis of all the different kinds of bacteria and how it changes from country to country, which is associated with a dietary change. And here's a picture, this is on a log scale. So this is uh, nine is a factor of 10 smaller than, than 10. And then um, this, one, this number is uh, another factor of 10 to get up to 11. So this is a really big dramatic change. 
And before consumption, these were the levels of uh, human microbiome uh, uh, bacteria and whatnot. Then after two weeks of eating uh, seaweed fiber, alginate, uh, the amount of, uh, of human microbiome, let's say beneficial bacteria, uh, increased in some cases nearly by an order of magnitude. And by three weeks, in some cases, it was more than an order of magnitude, or let's say roughly an order of magnitude. I don't know why it dropped after four weeks, but <coughs> this is very interesting to consider prebiotics as something that really helps gut microbiome flourish. So that's uh, an interesting effect. There's also some interesting weight loss components to seaweed. It turns out that seaweed is a very low glycemic index and can actually lower the glycemic index of other carbohydrates. <coughs> and also a reduction in estradiol, which um, has had uh, benefits in terms of weight reduction, which can be important in the US population. And these are some other um, tumor-related benefits that have been analyzed by JNTs and others. So these are just some of the highlights. And here's an example. Urokinase has been associated with an increase in, can in tumor development. In fact, here's a picture that shows with low um, urokinase, uh, there's a higher survival rate uh, with cancer. And if you have high urokinase, then the survival rate drops precipitously. And what's interesting is that if you start with a placebo and you go to seaweed and you go back to a placebo, there's a factor of two in your urokinase and creatinine um, that happens. And so it has a profound effect on these factors that contribute towards um, tumor progression in breast cancer. So these are just some of the results uh, that Jane has worked on over the years. And uh, their benefits accrue further and further. It's interesting, there's a lot of brown kelps that are eaten in uh, Japan, and some red seaweeds as well. Uh, like nori, I believe. And um, so the brown and the reds are what we have here off California as well. And there's no reason we can't develop a taste for seaweed breath. Yeah, okay, I got another question. Go because then we'll have the trifecta for like anti-aging. Right. So we've got um, we've got the omega-3s. Yes. We've got the prebiotics. Right. Is there a, a really strong anti-inflammatory um, benefit too? Because of those three right there are like, you know, if you can get all those three in one food, so do, do we know anything about anti-inflammatory yes. uh, effects? A key thing is to remember that omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Omega-6s yeah. are inflammatory, and the omega-9s in olive, olives and olive oil are actually anti-inflammatory as well. I don't know why it goes in that pattern, yeah. but the omega-3s are present in seaweed, and, they're, and the omega-6s are absent in seaweed. So um, for people who have the Alzheimer's gene, and I encourage you all to get 23andMe, costs 100 to $200, and you get to find out for you and your family, you know, are you a third or a half of Americans have at least one gene for Alzheimer's? That means you've got a three to 10 times uh, higher probability of getting Alzheimer's, what they call late onset Alzheimer's, which happens earlier than it should. <laughs> and, um, you know, a show of hands, how many people have had friends or family affected by Alzheimer's disease or other cognitive diseases over time? I mean, it affects nearly everyone. And imagine if we could add decades to the cognitive health span of individuals, starting with ourselves, yeah. with your own oxygen mask. And for the half of the population that is affected by the Alzheimer's gene, um, moving away from a Western diet is and that means moving your omega-6 and omega-3 ratio from 20 to 1, which is what it is in a Western diet, down to maybe 4 to 1, which could be achieved with an Eastern diet. Or if you get really extreme with seaweed and fish, you could actually hit 1 to 1. And that's actually what people think may be the paleo diet. Did you know that 100,000 years ago, the humans were reduced to one small yeah. group off of South Africa? Well, that ancient allele they've analyzed, the ancient gene of humans were all APOE4 Alzheimer's genes. Mm -hmm. So the ancient allele was a coastal allele yeah. that uh, lived
ripped off of seaweed and fish and maybe some vegetables. Speaking, oh. speaking of uh, speaking of Reddit, um, I went on the science thing this morning and, and I came across an AMA by a marine biologist. Yes. But there was something I saw about they were speculating that the, the people who, who inhabited the, the West Coast right. um, didn't come down, they came with me, they crossed the land bridge, but they didn't uh, come down by land, they came down by the cut forest, is their speculation. Fascinating. On the coast, exactly. And I'm, I'm the food I'll, that came out of California. Yeah. I'll reiterate this uh. West, Western Nigeria result, which is several thousand elderly people were done, examined in a study. And amazingly, they had completely decoupled the genotype for Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's gene, from its expression in terms of actual Alzheimer's. And they studied the diet of these Western Nigerians, and it comprised small fish, some seaweed, yams, and vegetables, and no grains. And that's how so big grains are no greens. grains, grains, no grains. That's right. And so um, that's where the omega sixes come from. And if you look at the history of mankind, the APOA three, APOA two alleles came in twenty or thirty thousand years ago, when uh, which was right about the time man started farming. So chicken or egg, we're not sure. But this idea of the ability to eat grains has been a recent mutation in human history. And 100,000 years ago, we were probably eating seaweed and fish and vegetables, which is kind of an amazing evolutionary history of mankind. And so this real paleo diet is something we have to consider going back to for a significant fraction of the population. And if you look at India, you've got 500 million vegetarians that need a source of DHA and EPA. And that's where the seaweed markets really take off. Uh, but in the US, I mean, we've got large vegetarian populations here. Why not have sea vegetables as an increasing part of our diet, particularly with the cancer benefits, the cognitive benefits, and the, the, the greater cognitive health span that's potentially there? Can we get B12 from the seaweed? Because that's a thing for vegans. I'm not vegan, but okay. that's a big issue. Did, um, did B12 come in? That's a good question. I don't know enough about B12. Um, I know that A, C, and E are fairly common as antioxidants, um, and I need to learn more about the B vitamins. I'm just curious. Sure. So um, that's a bit of a bit of the health story. Uh, any other questions on the health story before uh, um, we go over some other know, areas? Do you know any resources that uh, contrast various uh, mineral uh, contents of different uh, types of sea? Um, well, that's a good question. There are some studies. We certainly have examples that look at the carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. And that actually gets into the carbon export dimension of this. It turns out all seaweeds do a great job of exporting carbon, and the reds and browns in particular do very well. Uh, Mineral-wise, there are differences, and I think uh, a bit of literature searching on the internet, you should be able to find particular ones. The biggest challenge is you've got to figure out your seaweed species name by Latin genus and species. And once you've got that figured out, you can type it in along with mineral content or something. They do ultimate analysis, and what I'd encourage, if you're worried about metals, you wanna look at ultimate analysis, which is gonna be where they they burn it to ashes, and then they count um, in a mass spectrometer all the heavy metals that are there. And so that's probably a good way, ultimate analysis, to um, look at the seaweed that you care about and see how it's doing. You can also send in samples and ask to have an ultimate analysis performed and then I think it's probably going to be uh, $100 or $200 to get an ultimate analysis of a particular seaweed sample. But that's the kind of thing that we should encourage seaweed producers to do so that they can show the, the amount of heavy metals, show it's within the U.S. Uh, RDA. Um, and by the way, I'm going to pause for a minute and say there are a lot of people that are worried about iodine, but here's our understanding about iodine is that there's a big difference between eating raw iodine and eating um, a seaweed where the iodine is buffered by antioxidants. That's something that's really profound because, you know, they look, we look at the methane uh, reducer um, chromoforms are in these seaweeds, and that's again a halogen. But what's interesting is the cows tolerate the seaweed just fine, but you give the cows the same amount of bromoform, and the cows have a toxic reaction. So that's the difference between 
the antioxidants buffering the oxidating halogens versus the um, you know the raw uh, halogens by themselves can be toxic. So let's extrapolate that to another halogen, iodine, and say, what if the iodine's all bound up in these antioxidants? And there's really good evidence that Jane Teese and others have, have put out that um, you actually, uh, it's very well tolerated. And in fact, we don't know the answer yet, but our conjecture is that the antioxidants bind the halogens and the amount of ingestion uh, is actually greatly reduced for some species. And that's why we think that the RDA, by the way, for Europe and for Japan, for a, a, a maximum amount of iodine is five or 10 times higher in Europe and Japan than it is in the US. Mm -hmm. And so that's really key because uh, it suggests that what considered a maximum in the US may not really be a maximum. Mm -hmm. And so that's, uh, again, another factor. And I think a lot of it has to do with the whole food principle that eating a whole food gives you buffering that you don't have otherwise. And those are the ingredients in the seaweed that are not included in this analysis. So when it comes to iodine, you know, it's a grain of salt. And I think being at or above the uh, RDA for uh, things like iodine can be well tolerated. So it's definitely worth exploring that further. Yes? When you are surfing, yes. are you eating macrosis or are you eating other types? I, I've eaten both, actually, up in Santa Cruz. I didn't find any macrocystis last week, so I ate some laminaria, which was nearby, and I managed to scoop it up, but you know, like I saw it underwater and grabbed on and saw it. So what does that look like? It's a, a thin ribbon of very, very tough seaweed, and then on the sides are these nice, t tasty leaves, and, and those little fronds on the side are, they're only like one or two millimeters thick, so you can pick them off and you can chew on them. And it's, and it's really fun. I mean, a lot of times there'll be an evolution of texture that happens in the seaweed. And I use seaweed for texturing. In fact, I was very pleased to learn at the International Seaweed Symposium that, <laughs> uh, that they actually have developed in Chile a, um, last, yesterday I had a, a vegetable lasagna. They've developed a kelp lasagna. Mm. So imagine eliminating the noodles, which are high glycemic index, mm -hmm. gluten, you know, how many bad things are in pasta, right? and turns it into a kelp leaf, which is a whole food, phytonutrient, antioxidant, omega-3. Why don't we make kelp lasagna more often? <laughs> that could be the latest thing in a high-end restaurant. So, al dente. Al dente, exactly. So uh, I think there's huge opportunity <laughs> to be transforming our cuisine. There's even a spaghetti seaweed that they grow. It, it, it exists naturally off of Maine. And they're actually trucking that to New York and selling premium whole food spaghetti seaweed as a pasta substitute. Do you eat it raw always? Is that the best way to get the effects? I, I think you know there's a there's a, a transition of levels. Um, it's very common in the Philippines to blanch for two or three seconds. When I'm out surfing in clean water, I mean it raw, and I haven't had bad effects, and up to like an ounce or two. Um, as a condiment, it works great. And I think blanching is very safe because what the blanching does is you're gonna, let's say you, you blanch at 80 degrees Celsius for about two seconds or three seconds. That's going to pasteurize any uh, microbes that are on the surface of the, of the seaweed or kelp. You lose a little bit of, um, like for example, these phycobilicoteins are temperature sensitive. Above 40 Celsius, they're going to, to nature. And in fact, you can see a brown, a red seaweed will turn from brown to green in two seconds when you blanch it. You can see the phycobilla proteins denaturing. Mm -hmm. So it's not a zero effect. You do lose some, but the less processing, the better, right? And so if you're worried about microbes or disinfection, I would go for the two second pasteurization at 80 degrees Celsius. Then you can use it as a seaweed salad, and they do that all the time. In fact, the best seaweed salads that I've ever had have been in the Philippines. And what they've done is taken a nice red seaweed, fresh, really fresh, and blanch it for two seconds, add a vinaigrette dressing, toss and, <laughs> and add to the side. And uh, I think that's a great, a great thing to be working with and really embellishing and adding more. The big question we have is how do we take the benefits of raw seaweed, the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, the omega-3 fatty acids, and preserve them? over time. 90% of seaweed that's eaten today is dried seaweed. Right. And our nutritionists at Stanford University said, look, 
you've got to understand, drying is akin to oxidation. So if you're drying, you're oxidizing. And that means you're going to lose most of your antioxidants, some of your phytonutrients, and, and some of your omega-3 fatty acids. So what can we do about it? Well, it turns out there's this age-old technique of fermentation. And what we've done is start as a model of seaweed of sauerkraut, cabbage sauerkraut, and say, look, humans have co-evolved with lactobacillus for the last 15,000 years. And what sauerkraut is, and sourdough bread, I'll add, is the lactobacillus, you know, you're kneading and working the bread with your hands, that's actually inoculating the bread to become sourdough. And that sourdough is sour because of the lactobacillus. And what lactobacillus does is it starts taking over and, and processes the glucose uh, and into other forms, other carbohydrates, and it lowers the pH down to a pH of three and a half or four. And what that does is protect the food from other microbes. Yeah. And, where, and that's lactobacillus is one of the beneficial microbes that's in yogurt, for example. And so it goes after lactose, it goes after glucose and similar sugars. And so what we'd like to do is take the known working system of cabbage. And cabbage, you know, you have to pound or beat or knead with your hands, and it uses the same lactobacillus fermentation to get real cabbage. Now we have examples of cabbage sauerkraut that are shelf stable, not pasteurized. Like most of the in the US they pasteurize it. I don't know why. But if you go to Germany and get a real sauerkraut, you get a probiotic. I mean, when I went to Germany and I was there for Oktoberfest, mm -hmm. and I said, Oh, try some of this sauerkraut, you know, you put some on your bike. Well, it's not pasteurized, it's probiotic, right? So this is living lactobacillus, uh, and first of all, it was so fresh and so tasty. It was like day and night. And secondly, um, the probiotic benefits are enormous. So I was just kind of amazed by that. And then we found some sauerkrauts down in Australia that are shelf stable for three to nine months. And so I'm thinking- Unpasteurized. Yeah, unpasteurized, yeah. yeah. This is just equilibrium. I mean, I think they refrigerate them, but they're, they're shelf stable, and in fact, I'm remembering, you know, the Synergy Kombucha that's made right in Los Angeles? They ship that all the way across the United States, 3,000 miles, and we buy it in Boston, right? So you can go 3,000 miles with a probiotic food. Why can't we do this with seaweed sauerkraut? Well, there are one or two seaweed sauerkrauts we found down in Australia. They're like one or 3% seaweed and the rest cabbage. What we're researching right now with our colleagues in Germany and Tasmania is can we make a seaweed sauerkraut that's more seaweed than cabbage? And that's gonna move us in that direction because if we can capture all the benefits, and you know, this fermentation process is anoxic, so it's gonna preserve the antioxidants and the phytonutrients and the omega-3 fatty acids. We get it into a shelf-stable form. We can take this, we can ship it across the country and actually provide a shelf-stable uh, way of delivering the benefits of seaweed across the country. Can we make a hundred percent seaweed? Is there any technical, uh, you know, theoretical reason? I think there are some challenges. Um, we have to, first of all, understand there. Oftentimes, fermentation, like the creation of a fine wine, is a multi-stage process, and there's complexities associated with yeast, which involves some oxygen. Uh, it's just like making wine. So you've got to actually refine the process. Seaweeds oftentimes also have sulfur, and as you know, in wine, sulfites are an interesting challenge. They're a challenge to understand, you know, how do you make it work well? How do you make sure the wine works well? And so working with the sulfites is a big deal. As you know, winemaking is not a simple industry. Probably neither is sauerkraut. And so I think it's gonna take us a little while to get there. But kimchi has some examples, and there's umami and several other um, Japanese processes that I'm not as familiar with that we're learning about. That, and then some real fermentation experts as well in Japan that we're hoping to work with. But the idea is to get this working. So we don't have answers today, but we're thinking that if we start with a combination of seaweed, of sauerkraut, um, of cabbage, and seaweed, that we can move towards that direction. And there are a lot of things we can add to it, local vegetables that are particularly have the right level of sugars, which are important for the lactobacillus to process. These are all opportunities as we go forward. So we're develop we have a birds of a feather group doing research. In fact, we've gotten some of these, um, I want to call them bell, bell jars or whatever. They're the, the, the jars. Mason jars? Mason jars, yes. And you've got special uh, nipple tops that will let the CO2 out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's a great way. So we're doing this all across the world, right? We have some 
fermenters in Germany, mm -hmm. some in Tasmania, and some in the US. And we're going to be working this summer on this. And so if you get people interested here, we can add you to our uh, Birds of a Feather group on sea kraut. And we're hoping in a year or two to have a seakraut.com that's going to be a product that we can sell across the US and Europe and, and Asia. Can we be getting <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'd love to do some alpha <laughs> testing. How do we become guinea pigs? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I think we uh, we should develop a, a mailing list, and maybe we can do that through Reddit initially, and then build it and effectively um, be testing. And we need some alpha testing and beta testing. Uh, we just got to, you know, we're working right now on a formula that's going to get to some good seaweeds and get some good fermentation. And I think it may take, uh, we're hoping that later this year we'll have a product to test. Yay. And there's no traditional fermented seaweeds. That's not been a tradition in any of the There's places. a little bit in Japan. Uh, Korea really has been missing. And I think part of it is the understanding of the microbes. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, if you start with a non-blanched seaweed, um, it may be difficult for lactobacillus to take over. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it's about the right level of inoculation. And it could be that we start with a cabbage that uh, builds up a lactobacillus yeah. population and then add a blanched seaweed and get it the right combination and add a few extra ingredients that can help it and uh, and get to a successful fermentation. I think that's the, the challenge and the opportunity. So we're hoping to do more research on this and for anyone that's uh, culinary and or fermenting or biochemistry interested, I would encourage you to reach out and we can grow our group a little bit larger. So that's kind of our, our latest birds of a feather activity. <laughs> Molly, it's like little farm. Oh, I'd love to explore. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, I mean, any yeah. chef adventures there would be great. Yeah, so that's that's kind of a bit of an adventure on the culinary side. So <laughs> all this to say there's more than a dozen value chains for seaweed, and we're exploring those one by one. The biggest ones that are existing are probably seaweed foliar biostimulant, and I remember there were some questions early on, some interest, in how do we connect back to the farm? So I thought maybe we should spend a few minutes getting back to that principle. Mm -hmm. Because I think moving the use of seaweed foliar biostimulants from wineries today to high value vegetables with high nutrient levels, uh, going to fruits like strawberries and going then to even row crops, this is a revolution waiting to happen mm -hmm. across wow. the United States, across Asia. We know there are companies today that are making foliar biostimulants in Asia shipping it to India and just working on rice production because they make so much rice that even if they just hit the nominal 11% rice yield increase with this foliar biostimulants, that ends up being feeding hundreds of millions of people. Wow. So it's just a huge lever when you consider that all of these grains depend upon flowering. And flowering is the key thing. I think we think it's like something about the green algae way back then, they responded to competitive pressures from brown or red algae. And so they respond to these um, hormones and compounds that are in the red and brown algae by upregulating their gene expression, increasing flowering and budding, and increasing the yield that happens. And that's what we see with grapes. And so we love to explore. And this, it's been known for a while, but what's interesting is there's a stronger effect on the, um, the, the foliar biostimulant. We think when we these liquids are sprayed onto the surface of the plants, that they either affect the microbiome on the leaves themselves, or some of these ingredients are going through the stomata of the leaves and actually upregulating gene expression in the leaves themselves. We had, you had mentioned we had, had the analogy of trees and forests, and we were talking about how we do research about forests and how trees talk to each other. Right. But you're talking about that right now. I mean, I just realized that when they're talking about how trees communicate with each other, mm -hmm. and that's, but that's, yeah. The, the kelp are doing that too. They are. You're describing the mechanism for that. The greens, the reds, and the brown seaweeds are talking to each other yeah. in the sea. And, wow. and the, the mycelia are doing this in the soil system. And there's some connection between the seaweed and the sea and the, the leaves of the plants mm -hmm. that the leaves and the plants are responding very strongly to signals yeah. from the sea. Wow. And so this is kind of an amazing connection that brings it full circle back to the land. And uh, you know, I, I can't imagine a crop that wouldn't benefit uh, from this. Anytime we're looking at flowering and, and buds, um, you know, that's going to be a key ingredient. There are two places that seaweed foliar biostimulants have been known to benefit the most, and 
The first is this flowering aspect. The second is uh, the root density. Shortly after germination, a foliar application um, will actually increase the density and numbers of roots. And so if, and that of course contributes to soil carbon. So that's another second place. So I've seen specialized seaweed products oriented towards germination and oriented towards flowering. And I think that we barely scratched the surface because we've got 14,000 species to look at and we probably looked at a dozen, that's my guess. Could we home brew this from our local coat uh, kelp yes. and put it on our food forest? Definitely. Um, <laughs> what I would say is that there's, there's, there's several ways of doing this. Um, there are processes of solar drying that will result in a liquid extract coming out. And secondly, there are methods where you can crush the seaweed and get a liquid out that way. But you do need a liquid generally because oftentimes it's a water-based uh, spray yeah. that you end up putting on. So effectively, it's a liquid filtered extract. Yeah. Uh, but I would encourage some experimentation with local kelps and seaweeds to see what can be done. Yes, and that. My mother would just take seaweed and soak it. Basically, make something she called seaweed tea. Seaweed tea, and for use the that garden? on the plants. For the garden, yeah. And what did she apply it to the leaves? Uh, I honestly, I can't. I don't remember. Sure. I don't know. I think she put it on the soil. Actually, watered with it. Yeah. So the soil has been known to provide some effect. Uh, surprisingly, it's maybe ten times less than the effect uh, on the plants. Hmm. And I think it's important that. Um, this, it, with the seaweed tea, you want to make sure that you've actually lysed the cells. So that means that you either, lysing means breaking open the cell walls. Okay. And so it's going to either be by crushing, or uh, sometimes when you're if you're drying in the sun, it'll get hot enough that it'll actually uh, leak out the contents of the cells as well. Mm -hmm. so a blender. Yeah. A blender would work. You can have a lot of solids, and so it's going to require macro filtration and then micro filtration so you don't clog your spray nozzles. And, and the solids are going to have some other uses and benefits. You know, you could either use them for anything from, uh, well, biofuels certainly, crop residues. Um, there are various uh, solid ingredients as well. But a lot of cellulose, actually, in the solids. Last night I was sitting next to the guy who just got his um, filing permit for the kelp farm. Right. And I was hanging out listening to him talk to another kelp farmer. I'm not sure what he was doing, but it was like, outside my world and opened it up. But he was talking about, he was down in the funk zone near a winery and some truck came up and it was like crushing and juicing stuff. And I think it was, it was like someone who had just gotten a bunch of kelp. I mean, so, I mean, th that infrastructure service is here yeah. right. in, in our town. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So I think you know, this idea of crushing and juicing is a big one, Jan. But I'm applying this directly to the soil. Don't you have to worry about the salts in the seaweed? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Normally, yes. Or However, compost? the quantities that are being used are minuscule. Okay. So it's diluted with water, like 51 or 100 to 1. And micronutrients and minerals and salts are all related. And so when it's manageable, it's fine. And as long as you have drainage, the salts will drain back to the river or the sea. So I think those are the key ingredients to avoid an accumulation of salt. Well, this is one of the big problems we have here in our soils is the, is the buildup of salt because of our drought. Understood. Yeah. So there's several aspects to this. One is if you use groundwater that's brackish, we've seen this in India. What happens is the brackish water gets pumped up and it gets sprayed out and then it evaporates, right? So the first thing that happens is the water goes off yeah. and the salt stays in the surface soil. Yeah. Right, that's the accumulation of salt. To get a decrease in salt accumulation, you want to be irrigating with fresh water and have drainage. And then the salt concentration will decrease in the soil. And so the key is to build in the drainage, don't make it a, a saline bowl, and uh, have fresh enough water that you're not increasing the salt concentration, but you're decreasing it. So those are the key parts that we found in India. Add to that bit. Um, a microbial rich soil will have a lot of humus and right. salts bind into humic compounds. Ah. So yeah, if you have just a mineral soil, you're gonna have salt burn like crazy. Sure. If you have a rich, deep black topsoil, salts are a non-issue. That's so true. And I think when it comes to regenerating life in seas and soils, it's about the ocean, macroalgae, microalgae, and fish. And in the soils, it's about building that microbial community. And 
um, it is once hit by sea and twice hit by land. The land can have an effect that in carbon farming that can be gigatons per year. And this is largely underestimated because we've lived in a petrochemical NPK fertilizer farming world for 100 years. And the realization that the biology is at least as important as the chemistry is a new realization. And moving away from petrochemical killed soil, if you will, back to a living soil that's dominated by the mycelia being able to unlock the mineral available phosphate and even nitrate um, is a key factor because there, most soils have plenty of phosphorus. It's just in what may be an inorganic form. The mycelia, if you cultivated your mycelial uh, fungi, if you will, uh, in the soil sufficiently, they have the ability to excrete enzymes and unlock the phosphate that's already there. So unlike the fertilizer salesman, you may not need that much phosphate, maybe eventually no phosphate, and you've got nitrogen fixers that can actually fix nitrogen right out of the atmosphere and into your soil. So it took me a few years working with the carbon farming people to realize life beyond NPK, that you may not actually need NPK fertilizer in order to do what we need to do with high productivity. And to me, building that living soil is enormous because the carbon dividends are astounding. Mm -hmm. The ability to go with five times or 10 times as much carbon in the soil in terms of carbon sequestration, and at the same time, increase the moisture porosity and permeability of the soil. So that now, we're actually collecting that rainfall, holding it, and it's going down to the groundwater. That's a huge, a huge return. And I've got to think that the prebiotic nature of seaweeds and hydrocolloids is going to contribute to that microbial community development. And so yeah. that's an example yeah. where bulk seaweed could actually help the mulch uh, effectively that can contribute to those hum hummus-like or humus-like soils in the future. Wow. Yes, question. Uh, this is just a practical thing because I'm actually uh, planning on going and getting some seaweed and trying to make some seaweed tea. Nice. So you basically just crush it up really good and how are we doing, folks? You know, water really water water. Yeah. You okay, know, just to keep you out track here. So not just you know, for local use, if you're going to use it fresh, don't bother with fermenting. It's overly complex, and so if you can juice it. And or blend it as, as was suggested. You can macro filter out all the solids, and then if you're going to actually apply it, you know, informally, you can probably apply the solids to your soil mm -hmm. and then get some of the liquid onto the leaves. If you need to get it into a spray application with water, then you've got to micro filter it so you're not going to clog your spray nozzles. Mm -hmm. But then it becomes like a commercial scale where you can actually mix it in with the water and apply it as you'd apply uh, a regular water treatment. Mm -hmm. So that, that can all be done at different scales, and mm -hmm. I would encourage this approach, and it could be as simple as a blender, or it could be something uh, fancier, like a crushing apparatus or even a solar-based approach. Mm -hmm. But I'd start with that and um, yeah, start try a few different species of seaweeds and see what's going to work best, and then have some controls where you have none at all. Mm -hmm. What's your solar-based approach? Mm -hmm. That's based in the Philippines, but there's plenty of sun here as well. Um, traditionally, they would harvest the red seaweeds, and then they would dry them in the sun, and then sell them per ton to processing per carrageenan. And they usually sell them at about 30% moisture content. But what they noticed was, in the sand, there, were these, there was this liquid at, during the solar drying that was dripping into the sand while they were doing the drying. So they started collecting this liquid, and one of our staff, oh, the guy who actually runs our Philippine uh, country, Based operations said, what if we use that liquid as a biostimulant? You know, what kind of results would we get? We're still waiting for the actual farm results because it takes a while to do field trials and test on the farm and all the rest. But that liquid can come off and you can still deliver the dried seaweed to the carrageenan processors. So now you've got two value streams instead of one. We have other folks that say, you know, we've looked at this and the biostimulant value of the seaweed is five times higher than the carotene value, which is really amazing. And it's like, wow. just crush the whole plant and get a higher yield of um, liquid for the biostimulant and skip the carotene entirely. And that's another another approach. Could you get the carotene out of the leftovers? 
Maybe. You could still extract it later. This is the science of the biorefinery. And I would, I would say it's part industrial engineering, yeah. it's part uh, biochemistry, yeah. and part uh, management. Yeah. But effectively, uh, we can create a value chain of a biorefinery processing yeah. system that would start with, let's say, the phycobilla proteins uh, and include uh, phytonutrients. For example, Procoidin sells for about a dollar per capsule retail, just like a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. But people have reported benefits from osteoarthritis, not to mention some of these cancer benefits. I'm still a fan of using the whole seaweed, but if you're stuck in a pinch, maybe the procoidin is a good thing. So these high value nutraceuticals, high value uh, phytonutrients, and then you go into the whole hydrocolloids and these biostimulants. And so that's the first <coughs> one. And then you've got cellulosic biomass that can be used in, um, in feed and fuel and ultimately carbon export. So you've got an entire value chain of seaweed where the whole thing's gonna be used. And, and the, the leftovers of the seaweed could ultimately be sunk to the, the deep of the Santa Barbara Channel and recycled, because that's all those micronutrients, right? So what if we could convert our oil refineries to bio refineries and <laughs> reuse all those pipes that are already in there and, and see. Just change the, you know, the, the, you know, the pump, you know, the other stuff in it? It's a, it's a great else? platform to start. Minimizing <laughs> transport distance is really good. And I think yeah. ultimately we have examples of at sea bio refineries. They're even making liquefied natural gas with the Prelude, that giant ship. Mm -hmm. But with those much smaller ship, we could be looking at colonies of marine permacultures that are regularly harvested by harvesting vessels and bring in material to a biorefinery ship that's yeah. going to create the products from food, feed, and fertilizer that can feed our entire nation. Wow. So it's really quite a vision. I think it's, there are an enormous number of jobs that can accrue from this process, and I think it's a matter of getting onto that, um, onto that, uh, that, this, this growth that is already happening in Asia. One reason we're working in Asia today is it's a $10 billion industry. Yeah. We actually have great examples. I mean, I think today China sells $800 million in seaweed to Japan today, even though it's got a lot of heavy metals in it. <laughs> and I think once we build our industry enough, there's no reason we couldn't be touting the benefits of our clean ocean and clean seaweed. And heaven knows, Japan <clears throat> grows $2 billion worth of seaweed for food internally every year already. Mm -hmm. And they probably want more. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, <clears throat> did I tell you last night about the story of the herring population off Hokkaido, Japan, yeah. and the Sakharina kelp forest? Yeah. Imagine creating a Made in America project where we're able to take this technology to Japan and help them restore their fishery and their kelp forest. This is the kind of transformational project that I see is possible in the years ahead. We, we can look at places across the world from the Monterey sardine fishery to the coast of Namibia, where in 1967, they harvested $2 billion worth of sardines out of the sea in one year. <clears throat> they did the same in 1968. They did the same in 1969. And halfway through 1970, that sardine fishery collapsed, yeah. and it's never come back. So it's a bi-stable like Easter Island. You, can, you know, it turns out the sardine population of billions of sardines, that is a habitat all by itself. But if you don't have that habitat, you don't get the habitat, and the sardines don't survive on their own. Is that what bi-stable means? You yes. that word a lot. It means that you need... you're stable in a tropical rainforest, or you're stable with no trees at all. Yeah. Similarly, oh. I mean, Iceland used to have Iceland used to have trees, you know. They all got chopped down for fuel and firewood and ships. So, we look to how can we regenerate the life that once was? How do we rebuild mm -hmm. the river of kelp forest that once existed off of Santa Barbara? Mm -hmm. And this is how we do it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. The way we rebuild the river of kelp and the sardine fishery is by first creating the fish habitat of the kelp forest, scaling it to square kilometers that once were, and then having that fish habitat be the nursery for the forage fisheries of the future. Mm -hmm. And this is where we see rebooting life in the ocean, mm -hmm. effectively being able to regenerate life in the ocean on a massive scale, mm -hmm. and being able to feed people as well as the marine ecosystems.
then we have to do this. I think our life depends on it. If you look at the oxygen rates and how our oxygen meters are already down 2% yeah. just from the last few decades, and it's accelerating. Yeah. And it's like, how much closer to the Permian mass extinction do we have to get yeah. till we wake up and say we have to regenerate life in the oceans? And that's really the key, the key part of this. Yes? It, it seems to me that if you've got the capital, you should be able to at least do demonstration projects. Exactly. But you were also talking about the permitting issues. What right. Do you, what, in your viewpoint and your experience, what are the biggest obstacles in terms of the, the permitting aspects? Well, I think we need to, first of all, in the states, establish with the U.S. Coast Guard the precedent of creating marine permaculture vessels that can uh, upwell water. Hoses are common on ships today. That upwelling hose is just part of the ship and can grow seaweed behind the ship and navigate the seven seas and navigate, let's say, the Santa Barbara Channel. We create that precedent, register with the Coast Guard. We've already briefed the Coast Guard twice, and they're highly receptive. Good. We want to run with open arms to be embraced by the Coast yeah. Guard and say, Coast Guard, this is your jurisdiction, yeah. and you need to protect us from takeover by the NOAAs of the world. Or, I think there's a place for marine spatial planning, and it's near shore. Near shore, we've got highly impacted coastlines. We need to have a logical progression. But if you're 50 or 100 kilometers offshore, there's no reason you can't be an ocean vessel. Mm -hmm. And that's where the big payoffs are, because the ecosystem services are regionally based. It's not unusual for a sea lion to travel 100 kilometers in a day. Mm -hmm. So a sea lion can go from their rookery, head out to a marine permaculture and fish all day long, and come on back, oh. right? So that's where the regional ecosystem services are benefit, because when we hit the next marine heat wave, and we lose 90% of our kelp, not only off Northern California, but Central California, those sea lions will have a place to survive. Those ecosystem services that we build on marine permacultures are going to be climate resilient, because they have that source of deep, cool water that will work day in and day out, even during the worst marine heat wave. So we water condition the temperature and the nutrient levels to ensure a stable crop year in and year out, season in and season out. And that's the key as we see it to building in climate resilience into everything we do, whether it's biochar or carbon farming or marine permaculture in the sea. We've gotta be prepared for marine heat waves. We have to be prepared for droughts and floods and ensure that our soils and our seas are ready to survive the onslaughts that we know are coming in the decades ahead. So that's kind of a key, a key aspect. Nick, you had a question? Doldrums? Yes. Um, no hurricanes or typhoons, right? Yes. And have, have you considered much um, mm -hmm. prospects there? Of definitely, the, definitely. Not having to engineer for those high waves? Uh, well, the doldrums are key, and that's one reason in Philippines and Indonesia, we've gone to solar marine permaculture. So we've actually built solar domes that are geodesic, that are reminiscent of Buckminster Fuller and uh, they collect sunlight on the sea, and we have electric motors that will bring the, the system up. Because during the doldrums and during the sunny periods, you have the worst conditions for the seaweed. You've got high temperatures, you've got sunlight, and you have very little water motion. No waves, no wind, no currents. So those doldrum conditions are exactly the time solar power works best. And that's why we are starting with solar in the Philippines. And in fact, we're using some of the resilient fish pen technology of Tasmania, which has survived 11 meter seas, and use that as the basis for building solar rings. And those solar rings can actually drive the pumps. Oh, that's how it fits oh. together. Yeah. We were wondering, like, you were talking about the flat valves, but then where do these electric motors come in? Now I get it. Exactly. So okay. it's really a, a multi uh, faceted approach. When you have waves, you get the flapper valve, but uh, you can actually have it in one system solar or wave driven. And the doldrums are key and we think solar power is the answer, especially given the cost of solar power today. So that's where we start, especially in inland seas. And I think Santa Barbara Channel would be perhaps an example when there are no waves in the summertime. We've got time for one or two more questions. Any other uh, areas, places? Just a question, did you say you already have a, a functioning uh, prototype on Hawaii? 
we, we did have one. It was a phase one demonstration. In phase two, we were in Indonesia. And this year, we're building the major subsystems in the Philippines and deploying our upwelling systems in the Philippines. The objective is to show, first of all, that in the Philippines, commercially relevant seaweeds will grow better with the deep water nutrient irrigation. And secondly, in phase 3B, that we can actually get to the hectare scale. And so locally, in terms of the barriers, I mean, we've got these permitting questions. And back to the earlier question, I think we want to lead, technology leads and permits and, and legal follows. And so by using the admiralty law, we can yeah. lead by having ocean vessels and then establish that as a safe precedent yeah. and then move gradually towards easier permitting closer to shore. For in the case that we want to actually restore mm -hmm. the, the kelp forest onshore or near shore, that will become acceptable over time. So that'll be part of the evolution. From a financing standpoint, we need to raise private capital that will enable initially the research and development with tax deductibility and later a sustainable set of businesses that can grow first hectare scale uh, kelp forests and later uh, kilometer scale kelp forests offshore and even closer to shore. And this is something we can do in California sooner rather than later. We have a group uh, called Drawdown Marin that's interested in trying to do this in Marin County that could begin to address the purple sea urchin problem. But I think the Santa Barbara Channel has a unique opportunity to begin this effort as well. In particular, the Santa Barbara Channel has this deep anoxia property, which means the carbon export is that much more valuable here in the Santa Barbara Channel because it's one of the three major anoxic basins that we have, and that's a natural resource. In addition, it's a great way to test ocean light. And ocean light is not as many waves, not as bad wind, a good way to get the system up and running and prototyping. And so why not consider uh, developing some early marine vessels that we could build in the Santa Barbara Channel and test in the mesoscale eddies that exist here and test out everything from underwater sailing to kelp forest growing. That's the kind of thing we'd love to build a group around and we'll need some marine expertise, hardware engineering expertise, uh, permitting and coastal expertise and working with the Coast Guard. There are probably a dozen roles and responsibilities that we'll have to explore. But this is the kind of thing that our local climate core groups can start working on this year and building capacity as we go and consider, let's build a small one, let's see how these marine vessels work, and let's test it out and show that it works safely. Once we demonstrate it safely on a small scale, we can scale up to commercial scale. What's your connection with Dr. Nina? Do you, do you know our LTER group? I've heard of LTER, yes, and that's an, very important to establish a long time baseline of the environmental conditions and the conditions that exist there. And then we've also had some connections to the Bren School, I believe, at UCSB. And I think they've been really key at looking at bridging the connections between the basic science and the sustainable business applications in the future. So I think that's going to be a key aspect as well. In addition, we've had interaction with people at Scripps, uh, the University of California, extending from Davis, looking at the Cal methane aspects, to Stanford University, looking at some other aspects. So I think there are great opportunities to connect in that way. In addition, Woods Hole and MIT have been very active as well. So we encourage the academic third-party validation of the benefits. I think we need to uh, think outside the box when it comes to growing small-scale kelp forests and making them larger, and building our capacity so that each local chapter can develop certain aspects of it, and we can find the best practices and scale them around California and around the world in years to come, and ideally accelerate our seaweed adoption uh, here to embrace what's been done already in Asia and then perhaps extend it further. So I look forward to that and welcome. Yes, Christina? So I think this um, kind of picks up on the conference, the French Pro conference in San Francisco you mentioned in the beginning. Yes, I was there a week ago. Oh, that was, okay, sorry, I thought you were saying that. I know that was the regenerative um, Yes. June 23rd in San Francisco will be a workshop from 10 to 4, <laughs> focused on business, sustainable what businesses. What would be the outcome you would wish for from this event? Okay, I'll I would hope for uh, uh, the beginning, the core of a working group, and the, uh, the early um, validation of regenerative returns, we hope will happen by next quarter as well. So yeah. we hope to have a prototype uh, by next quarter of at least one agreement for regenerative returns, and then the possibility to generalize and perhaps bring uh, some investment banks have expressed interest in making 
regenerative returns accessible to um, small investors for retirement plans and mm -hmm. things like this, so that it becomes much more democratized and much more decentralized. Yeah. And so I think these are the key questions we need to understand. How do we design marine permaculture to distribute capital broadly? Yeah. You know, we have subsistence seaweed farmers, several million in Asia, that could benefit by going offshore. The seaweed fishermen farmer families have access to small boats. Could they be operating these offshore? Uh, how would that work? And how does distributed farming look in the United States? I mean, we have, I would say California and the US is a big ocean nation because we have more EEC ocean area than we have land area. So as a big ocean nation and a big okay. ocean state of California, what can we do to ensure a distributed economy grows up out of marine permaculture? What's the easy? Exclusive economic zone. Okay. It goes Aviation. out 300 kilometers from the coastline wow. of California. And Ooh. that's other people out. That's all federal waters. It's an exclusive zone for the United States. Mm -hmm. And even beyond that, international waters. Yes? Can you just say a word about the enormous numbers of jobs in relation uh, yes. to this, where in the world will we look to see an example of that? Well, I think Asia is a good example today where um, in China they're growing, they have more than a thousand square kilometers under cultivation today, and it's an $800 million export industry to Japan alone. So nearly a billion dollars, you know, if you consider other countries and other uses. Um, that's a billion dollars in revenue, which probably provides nearly a million jobs in China. And um, it's not a zero-sum game because we barely scratched the surface of how to use seaweed in the Western world. How do I exactly Google what search terms? Well, jobs, look at seaweed jobs. I would say market analysis of uh, seaweed production in Japan, Korea, and China. Thank you. Uh, those are the really industrialized nations, and there are even more seaweed growers in Indonesia and Philippines. And in fact, entire communities have been based on seaweed farming in rural areas. Yeah. One last question? Yeah, how are we doing? Good? Everybody? Um, I think we have some of your emails by then Friday. If you don't think, if you want Brian to have your emails, it's yes. up to you. Um, I have business cards and I'm happy to uh, you know, yeah. establish connections so we can continue. Right, so he gets hundreds of emails, so you're probably good to give us our your bunch so that we can move into him Definitely. in a group because then, yeah. then it won't get lost in the. That's in important. Stuff. So that make sure there's a. There's a sign-up sheet oh, over here that you can yes. make sure you're What about that? There, you were talking about some of the subs in Reddit and then establishing a particular Reddit sub subgroup yes. for Santa Barbara. That's correct. Um, you know, is that something that, because I was just on Reddit. Okay. <laughs> and I looked up your name right. and there's only two like subs. References. Two and there references. may just be one or two subs right now and the individual chapters will be forming. I think right now we just want to get to the marine permaculture subreddit, uh, and it, we're right now tentatively naming it the Climate Core. But I can put you in touch with Jen and Sean, based in the Bay Area and Seattle, respectively, who are helping to uh, crystallize, if you will, the reddits that the subreddits that we'll be using. I've spent way too much time on Reddit. So oh, that's I great! Would be we'll so be excited well. to do that. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. I, I'm relatively new to Reddit, uh, but we're going to refine this, and I'm happy to put you in touch with our volunteers who are working in this space. And yeah. so what would be the best way to do that? Give it to us as a group, and then we forward it to Brian. Definitely. Okay. And then that'll make it easier, because he gets hundreds of emails. You're in That's the, you're, fine. You're in a, in, and right. I know that. Right. So we can, he'll know that we're sending him a group. <laughs> so that you but guys are in contact. you're a Reddit coordinator who can set it up and link oh, it to I, other I, things? I'd love that. Sure. Yeah, the coordinators are great. You can have one. Yeah. <laughs> so what we can do is we can set it up so everybody can communicate with each other. I think that would be good. Agreed. Um, somebody can either start a group or we can. Yeah. And I would encourage us to, to use the Reddit communication channel as a great way to mobilize. Because okay. that's how we're building our volunteer task force. We're calling the Climate Corps. And it's meant to be a hub for these marine permaculture efforts and other impact funding efforts that will ultimately have a transformative yeah. effect on our world. Can we do terrestrial stuff too? Definitely. Yeah, we're yeah, right through the climate core because it has to be seas and so Yeah, right. definitely. Okay, this looks good. I'd like to thank Brian. He's amazing. <laughs>
I'll tell you. Thanks so much. Um, so if anybody hasn't signed a poster, sign it. That's a special little gift for Brian. He'll know who you are. When I send the emails to him, he'll understand. So if anybody's not on, didn't send us an event, Eventbrite registration, then make sure your email's on that list so we can gather them up and send okay. them to Brian. And I'm, I'm thinking about getting lunch here at the cafe if it's open. No. Oh, no. Natural no. cafe. Oh. We're going to take over to the natural cafe. Oh, that's cafe. fine. Okay. Very Lots good. of room over there. Wonderful. So if people want to go that way, keep yapping. Well, thank you so much. Fun. It's an incredible group. Yeah. And uh, you've been getting pigs on our first workshop. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really good. Sure. I have cards if anyone wants to be in touch. I say I need a card. Good night. You with March.